today we're going to talk about mothers, but I know that there are many fathers that are just as loving and just as caring as mothers. But since today's Mother's Day and Father's Day comes in a month, we're not talking about fathers today. We're just talking about mothers, even though much of what I say applies to fathers as well. So dads, don't feel left out. I promise in a month I'll, I'll preach a sermon that's more about you. Um, but first, let's join in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you for gathering us here so that we can worship you today. And Lord God, we ask that you bless the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our minds. May everything we do and everything we say be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So when I was a child, I had to go see the doctor regularly. And the doctor had to inflict pain on me that was necessary. He had to do something to me that, that definitely caused me to tear up and to be in quite some pain. The first time I went to one of these doctor's appointments, my mother came with me. It took every ounce of my mother's being to hold herself back from punching the doctor in the face. Oh. As sweet and as kind as my mother is, and even though she knew that this was necessary, every part of her just wanted to clock that doctor, so she had to hold herself back. I'm quite certain that seeing my seeing me in pain caused my mother more pain than it ever caused me. After that appointment, it became my older sister's duty to take me to these doctor's appointments. Oh. <laughs> then when I was in college, I had to have surgery on both of my legs. I was the first and possibly still the only child of my mom's to ever require surgery. And so I went in to have surgery. It was a quick surgery, about a half an hour per leg. So about the total time that it took for my mom to, you know, give me a kiss goodbye until she had to see me in the recovery room was about an hour and a half. That hour and a half, I think, aged her a few years. She had her Bible in her hand. She, had, she knew it would be tough for her to, to see me go through surgery or to be there while I went through surgery. And so she planned on, you know, reading her Bible. If she was struggling, she couldn't do that. She was holding her Bible, gripping it so tightly that her knuckles were white. She could not open that thing. She couldn't do anything. She just sat there begging God to let me be okay and worrying as any mother worries. When Walter was born, he had the cord wrapped around his neck a few times. We didn't know this before he was born, but then, you know, everything seemed fine. Until he came out and his face was blue. I saw that look on the doctor's face. I knew something wasn't right. I sat up immediately and I saw my baby boy with his blue face not breathing. And my life seemed to simply stop at that moment. It was suddenly like I couldn't really hear anything else that was going on. All of my focus, the only thing I cared about in the world was my baby boy breathing. It took a few minutes for them to you know, get the cord off his neck and then do whatever it was they were doing over on the side, but it felt like forever until finally I heard that baby boy cry. Hallelujah. Motherhood has this way of kind of messing with our emotions. It's pretty tough to be a mom sometimes because everything just gets so heightened. I mean, us mothers would do anything in the world for our children. We would give up our own lives if it meant saving the lives of our children. We would do anything in this world to keep our children safe. That's what mothers do. The Shunammite woman, whose name we unfortunately never learned. That's such a sad thing. You know, they left her name out. But this wonderful Shunammite woman, she um, cared about nothing else more than her son. She cared so much about her son that she was willing to do anything in the world for her son to be revived. Because this woman, she had been unable, unable to have children. You notice that that's a theme, especially in the Old Testament, but throughout the whole Bible. She was unable to have children until she met the prophet Elisha. And then she was so kind, and she was so gracious to Elisha, that Elisha's like, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? And that's when his servant, Gehazi, said, well, you know, she doesn't have any children. She's getting older. Her husband's getting older. And so Elisha said, you know, within this season, you are going to give birth to a son. 
And she was so thankful when that son was born. It was something she didn't ever think would happen. She was so thankful. She loved, and she was devoted to that little boy. And then suddenly one day, he had probably been out running around with his friends, you know, doing what boys do, and maybe fell down and hit his head too hard and didn't know what the, anything was wrong. And, you know, until his head started really bothering him, so he went to his dad, and then his dad said, okay, go to your mother. And then he died in his mother's arms. And that mother, she knew that her baby was a miracle. She knew that he was such a miracle, and she was not willing to give up hope. She was not willing to believe that her son was dead and that that was the end of the story. So instead, what does she do? She goes and she lays the boy on the prophet's bed, and then she gets a donkey, and she goes as fast as she can to find the prophet herself. She doesn't send anybody else to do this task. This is something that only she can do. And she gets there and she tells the prophet what happened. And at first he says, okay, Gehazi, you know, his servant, you go back, you go and you cure the boy. She says, no, you're the prophet who blessed me so that I could have this child. You are coming with me as long as I live and as long as you live. I am not leaving this place until you come with me me to heal my son. She never loses faith. And then Elijah gets there. Of course, Gehazi really did not have the power to heal the boy. But then Elisha gets there and he lays his own body upon the boy. He breathes his breath into the boy. And then the boy awakes. The boy is alive from the dead. Thanks be to God, Elisha had the power to heal that boy, and that mom was so persistent, she was not giving up hope until she knew that she had used every last resort. And even though that boy had been dead, through this wonderful power, through this wonderful miracle of this man of God, he lived again. But all of us moms know, some far too much, that it is every mother's worst nightmare that something could happen to their child. And unfortunately, it's a nightmare that sometimes comes true. In my four years as pastor here in this church, we have had four sets of parents have to say goodbye to their children. And before I arrived, I know of at least three others who had to do the same. These mothers have come to know the world's worst pain. Did you know that before Jesus died, he was carrying his cross, and then we know Simon and Serene came and you know helped him carry his cross. But as Jesus is walking with Cyrene with the cross, as he himself is in pain, he turns and he sees these women wailing and beating their chest. And Jesus, as he's carrying his cross, or Cyrene is carrying it for him, he stops and he looks at these women and he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nurse. He was alluding to the hardships that would come and even maybe hardships that are still to come where there will be war and persecution and peril. And Jesus knew that it would be harder for a mother to see her child in pain than it would ever be for that same woman to go through that same pain that their child was going through. Jesus knew that there was no greater pain in the world than for a mother to see her child be harmed. Just about any mother in the world at least any loving mother would take the place of her child if it meant saving them from harm. I don't know if you saw it, but this past week, I don't remember where. I saw it in the news, but I don't remember where. There was a mother whose house was on fire. She had her toddler in the house. They were on the third story of the house, and there seemed to be no way to get out of the house. So the mother picked up her toddler boy, and she jumped from the third story to the ground. She jumped intentionally. She hit the ground with her feet, and then she rolled backwards, and that boy did not have a scratch on him. That little boy was completely safe. The mother might never walk again. When she jumped and she landed on her feet, she damaged her spine pretty badly. 
But when they were, she was in the hospital, somebody came in to interview her and they asked, you know, do you regret what you did? Do you regret jumping from the building? And she said, absolutely not. Seeing her baby boy there alive and well and playing is all that she needs to know that even if she never walks again, she will never regret jumping from the building. Mothers will do amazing things if we know that it means keeping our children from harm. So on this Mother's Day, you know, a wonderful day when mothers get to be honored. That sounds absolutely wonderful. But on this Mother's Day, we do honor our mothers, and we should honor our mothers. It's something that we should all do. I think it's kind of a, a national come-to-church day, because what mother does not want their children to come to church with them? But on Mother's Day, especially this Mother's Day, as we know that there's so much pain in the world, I mean, every day I think about those Nigerian girls, every day I pray for them, and my heart just breaks, especially imagining what those mothers must be going through as they wait in pain and in agony and in anguish. <laughs> and so on this Mother's Day, I want us to do something a little different. Of course, I want us to pray for our moms and to, to share our love with our moms, but I also want us to pray for those moms who have learn what it means to lose a child, and to pray for those moms who wait in anguish, trying to figure out if they will ever have their child again in their lives. So today, I hope you'll join me when the, the moms that I truly want to pray for is I want to, I want to pray for Bev and Celeste and Alicia and Don, who in this community within the past four years have had to bury a child. And I want to pray for Mariel and for Margaret and for Shirley, who in the years just shortly before that also had to bury a child. And I want to pray for all those other moms who I don't know about, but who God knows about, who have also had to bury a child. And I want to pray for Mindy Sauer, the mom of Ben Sauer, who sits by her son's side every single day waiting for the inevitable to happen. And I want to pray for the mom of 13-year-old Amir, the mom who brought her son to this country so that he could have a better life, only to lose him to violence. And I want to pray for all of those moms of those Nigerian girls, all of those moms who wait every single day asking God for a miracle, asking God to bring their baby girls back to them, asking for their daughter's return. So on this Mother's Day, Yes, we need to honor our mothers. It made it to, to the Ten Commandments, so it's probably something we should do. Honoring our mothers might be a good idea. But not only do I want to do that, but I also think that we need to pray for those who know what it means to experience loss as a mother. That Shunammite woman had her prayers answered. She was persistent. She was faithful. And she had her prayers answered. Now we know that sometimes our prayers are answered and sometimes our prayers aren't. But we know that our prayers have power. So that's why I ask that we lift these mothers in prayer today especially. Because today, not only do we need to bless our own mothers, but we really need to bless those mothers who know pain. And we also need to pray for Christ to return. Because there will be a day when Christ will return. And when that day comes, there will be peace on earth. And finally, when that day comes, when there will be peace on earth, no mother will ever again need to cry for her child. And that will be a time when we truly rejoice. So let us pray for the mothers and mothers, the mothers who we know who are suffering, as we know that there will be a day when they will see their children again. And let's join in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, through the power of Christ, we know that every mother who mourns, every mother who cries will see their child again. Lord God, you have blessed them, and you will bless them, and through the power of Christ, they will see their child again in your heavenly kingdom. But Lord God, even if they have that faith, even if they have that assurance, they are still hurting today. They are still pain today. So Lord God, we ask that you bless them, that you bless them all with your love and with your salvation and with your Holy Spirit to carry them through these troubling times. And gracious God, we especially ask that you bless those girls 
who were kidnapped, and that you bless their mothers as they wait in pain, begging for their children's return. Lord God, we ask that you bless all of those mothers who suffer today because there is no greater pain than seeing a child suffer. Please, Lord God, bless us all, inspire us with the faith that we need to carry us through this love, even when we know such horrible hardship. And Lord God, we lift all of our loved ones who have gone through these pains in prayer today, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.